organization probably to have uh, you know three functional usability labs for us one in new york city one in pune and one in chennai so we have a dedicated team of uh, user researchers usability analysts um, visual designers ui developers usage analytics folks everybody so <clears throat> basically right um, i will start with um, you know our topic here is big data killing customer experience right every uh, movie or every book or anything that we you know kind of read has a three act play what is a three act play right if we take up a fairy tale right um, there is this cinderella story we they introduce the character right the, there is a poor girl who's uh, facing so many issues in a you know home and then suddenly she gets a boon and then she loses it and then finally she you know kind of you know realizes the, her dream and lives happily ever after right that's a three act play i'm trying to follow a kind of a three act play for a, for my presentation here and i'm going to tell you two stories one in the beginning and one at the end and probably set the stage for some of the big data um, you know uh, you know uh, preliminaries or some of the you know difficulties that we handle due to big data right so that being said i'll say uh, start right away with the big data da uh, story right now uh, we are a company that respect you know information security a lot so i'm trying to mask names but in reality we are talking about our company here right so <clears throat> the idea here is i am a part of a financial organization inartics is uh, you know customers are all you know financial folks right financial services uh, brokers traders activity activity that is kind of bothering all his customers or users in our case the user is the customer because uh, you know we make applications which are used by brokers and traders who are our internal as well as external customers right so this person wants to find out which is the most monotonous and repetitive activity that is going on in this application which is the most used application or the portal and then try to make their lives better right that is the kind of exercise that is interested upon him now what he does is he obviously goes to his set of you know experts in this case whenever we talk about data or intelligence we speak about business intelligence teams right so obviously he goes to his set of you know business uh, intelligence folks and then he puts the same question across to them okay what is bothering my users what is bothering my customers right and how can i help them and please find the most repetitive and monotonous activity in this application so that we can make their lives better right these business intelligence guys they go around they start fishing information they collect data and then you know they organize data you know they kind of you know put in some visualizations they come back with a we would have seen in movies you know these in the streets right these guys bring bears along with them and then they start hitting the drum and the bear starts dancing right alan cooper has written a book called you know inmates are running the asylum it's a very interesting book it talks about how electronics is designed by people who don't actually know the customers right he talks about dancing bearware right the metaphor here is a dancing bear which is very entertaining to see right of course it's interesting people sit around and watch it you know people who went for uh, you know go for grocery shopping people who go, who go for you know important errands they sit there and watch the bear dancing in the streets as soon as the <clears throat> show is over they remember oh god i forgot everything they run back to their errands it has served no purpose for them right so it's called a dancing bearwear apparently that's what we see here it's a card diagram but apparently none of the data data underlying this is revealed right so he asks what the hell is happening here can you tell me what's happening here right that's the obvious question that the product manager asks because he has no intel nothing uh, you know which can reveal what's going on now we go to the you know uh, general setup of what big data is i'm hoping that all of us know about big data right so generally speaking you know can anybody give me an example of big data anybody google search awesome so right uh, search engines big data you just put in a you know a small uh, keyword and it you know gives you 17 pages of results big data right social media every day every day in time every minute we you know we use facebook and it keeps on updating so much information right 
So a lot of big data and you know uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know so many social uh, media applications. We are pumping in data into the digital world and apparently you know it's getting crowded and crowded and crowded. Right, so that is big data. A little bit of history, right, how it came into being. In 1786 there was a person by name William Playfair who came up with this big first dashboard on a copper plate. He explained, you know, what are the exports and imports that happened in and out of England, which was the very first dashboard. It was very interesting to see and it was very, very clear to see. But then what happened during the due course of 200 years from 1786 to mid-1980s was that they invented what is called as the executive information systems. That again is a very interesting piece of information, right? So this executive information system is nothing but for executives, they are giving some sort of financial data. And Stephen Few, uh, he's a, a very uh, you know, interesting author, he researches da data dashboards and everything, right? He says that even executives can read the executive information uh, dashboards, right? Even executives is a term which is kind of demeaning because he mentions that executives are basically dumb and they have very less attention span. As they move up the ladder, they become dumber. That's what we say. Right? Attention span is very low. Whenever we go to our manager and start talking beyond two minutes, they say, okay, okay. Just tell me what's the bottom line, right? That's what is their attention span. So we need to understand their mindset. And, you know, this executive information system was done with a very noble purpose. To make sure that people understand what is going on with what is happening in the company, right? So that kind of, you know, transformed and, you know, data warehousing came into being. Business intelligence came into being. Walmart started the data warehouse revolution. And, you know, we are at a point where we are, you know, the slaves of big data and big data visualizations, right? So hopefully it comes back. Okay. So we are moving towards this big data visualization trends. One of the examples that I showed you was the, you know, big, the card diagram, right? Let's, let's wait for a second here. I just wanted to show you this, right? We are all moving towards this big data visualization, the bubble charts, you know, the card diagrams which I showed you, you know, uh, the circle packing. If you look at this, so much information has been packed into tiny spaces, right? And we, we, people expect us to find what is going on here, right? So that is kind of, you know, it's kind of insulting to me as a UX designer or a customer experience analyst, right? So basically, we'll come to that part, right? The cribbing part comes later. But now let's talk about, uh, you know, one interesting thing that I read in Gartner, Gartner's uh, research, right? They say that by 2015, we'll be needing 4.4 million data scientists. The word scientist means that they do research. But in reality, here they speak about people who can just take data from multiple sources and make it usable, transform them into data. I mean, uh, usable form of, uh, you know, uh, information. That's what they call scientists. It's not about analyzing data. It's so much about just making it into packets, you know, um, messages, you know, usable formats and using them. So it's a staggering number and we are not even invited to play their game, right? So we need 4.4 million data scientists, but not 4.4 million UX analysts, right? The data is big, but there is no one to tame it. And one other thing is it states that only 1% of the world data is being analyzed currently. So imagine all that junk that is lying around in the digital world, nothing is happening, right? It just stay th stays there. You know, people create random websites, they throw in a lot of information. Let me share this stupid video. If I don't have any time to uh, kill, I just upload a video on Facebook, right? The junk keeps adding on and on and on. Right? One other important thing is the revolution of data warehousing brought about by Walmart. Walmart, as you know, is one of the top 10, you know, uh, most valuable companies of the world, it, it spins money like anything. And it says, the tagline says, our prices are always low. You know how they came up with this strategy? They are the ones who invented data warehousing. Right? In 1992, they started 2 TB of data, and today they are handling 2.5 petabytes of data. Right? I'm sure you all know the categorizations of this, you know, uh, gigabytes, you know, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, right? 
zeta bytes, yota bytes, God knows what will come later, right? So if it keeps on increasing, and you know, the US Library of Congress, they preserve history, they keep on collecting more and more and more information every day. And then you know, where can, I, where can they store all, all this, right? We cannot see it, but we need to store it somewhere, right? How can we reduce spaces and increase the storage? That's what they're all, always about. And 571 new websites are being created every minute of the day, right? So with all that, you see this? We cannot crib that so big data is being, you know, thrown around everywhere. It's us who are creating this big data, right? As I already told you, we uh, throw this stuff around <coughs> into the digital space, and by 2020, look at how much data we are going to throw into that space, right? So it's really bewildering. It guessing time, right? Anybody can anybody tell me what kind of chart this is? Any guesses? Okay, anybody else? Uh, obviously, it's called a node map or a node chart. <laughs> right? Because, see, there is a point to this. I'll come to it. Okay. It's called a node chart. It's used for, you know, relationship mappings. Obviously, there is a central core and, you know, it keeps on going around and around and around. It gets collected, you know, into huge, huge, you know, sectors. And then, <clears throat> You know, it is obviously made for, you know, showing affinities, relationships, so on and so forth, right? Any guesses on what this chart is? It looks like a floor plan, obviously. <laughs> but uh, uh, the name is not very intuitive as it looks, right? It's called a tree map. God knows why it is a tree map. There should be some sort of an explanation for why it is called a tree map. And obviously, right, uh, New York Times published a, you know, article on Obama's budget planning using this tree map, right? So we have to look into that and find out what's going on in US. So yeah, those are some sort of examples. This is even bewildering. I didn't want to, you know, even mention the name of this. This is called a heat map, you know? I don't know what's happening in this area, right? So <laughs> technology only has ways to you know convert data into visualizations one on one it doesn't simplify it so it, it has only so much intelligence right there is no simplification of big data there is only one on one mapping right now this is an interesting part right we spoke about how data is picked okay there, there is this uh, data warehousing you know data mining happens and then there is the business intelligence team which picks it up you know, it pulls from various databases, creates data visualization charts, etc., etc., pushes reports to executives and managers, right? So this is kind of small, but I'll explain what is happening here, right? There are various data sources in an organization from which data is sent, and it's pulled up into a big data ball, right? From there, what they do is they use, you know, big data platforms like Hadoop, you know, uh, MapReduce is a technique, I mean, Google's uh, MapReduce, you know, they kind of, you know, transform this data into usable information. And then what they do is they push it to the next team, which is the business intelligence team, right? They create beautiful charts, which we saw previously, and then they push it out, right? Now the executives and managers need to make informed decisions based on what is being thrown out. Now, is there something missing? Obviously, there's a UX conference. So UX is missing, right? But how or why? Why should we introduce UX into this process, right? I would say that a visualization expert should be a part of this cycle, right? What is a visualization expert? Probably if some, some companies have already used a visualization expert as a kind of a, you know, job role, I'm not sure about that. We just want to introduce a new breed of uh, UX folks called the visualization experts. Now that we are all moving into big data. If they need 4.4 million data scientists, we need 4.4 million visualization experts, at least half of it, right? We should, we should be responsible for creating order not chaos right apparently my team thought that this is a very you know um, attractive visualization expert and <laughs> so uh, apart from the attraction that you know this emanates what are the other qualities of a fine visualization expert you know the person should have a user experience best practice knowledge and then obviously a bit of domain knowledge and then a bit of bit of knowledge on the big data technologies and then a bit of knowledge in the data visualization method methods, right? A bit of is a very tricky term, right? I would give 100% importance 
to both these things, right? On the left side, domain knowledge and user experience best practices. Now, when that is clear, the person would know what kind of uh, you know objectives are needed by the company, what is the information that executives are looking for, you know what are managers looking for. That will be clear if that is there. Now, these are just guidelines. Data visualization methods are guidelines. You can take a book, open it, you can find data visualization methods, simple ones. And then big data technologies, once we start conversing with these business analysts, you know, we just need to get acquainted with these things. So this is a typical role, blended role, that a visualization expert needs to have. And every company which, which handles big data should have a visual, visualization expert. That is something which I wanted to propose. And just a little bit of information, right? I'm not going to you know, kill you with these bullets. But l let me just give you two instances here, right? One is uh, John Maeda is a graphic designer. And he, he is an alma mater of uh, you know, MIT. He came up with a book called Laws of Simplicity, where he wants to create order out of chaos. If there is a big room, there is a you know, huge chunk of people there, how do we simplify? Even in you know, perceiving them, how we can you know, come up with simplicity, right? There are TED Talks by John Maida, very interesting. So the key focus here is simplicity. That is very, very important. And then there should be business focus, right? By business focus, what I mean is that, you know, they keep on talking about data requirements, data requirements, but nobody talks to them, asks them to tell stories, right? They need to dream big. Walmart should say that, okay, I am dreaming big. I should be the number one company. And then they should say, how do you want to become a big company, right? Make them tell stories. That is where we get business focus, right? They, 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 we cannot keep on, you know, dwelling on data. Data focus is a part of it. But we should also be focusing on business focus and user focus, right? And then finally, right, there, there is this uh, very interesting phrase going on, design for volume, velocity, value, and variety. If people have read you know, big data papers, that's a very important thing that they say. But I should, we should say, right, we should design for scalability, priority, minimalism, and usability. Right? Most of these terms are very, very uh, obvious terms, right? <clears throat> scalability, right? So what happens if data keeps on increasing? How would we design for that? We should keep that in mind, right? Priority. What happens if, uh, you know, they say, okay, today our idea is to go to, you know, Latin American markets. Tomorrow the priorities may change. They, should, they would say, you know, I want to concentrate on, on European markets. Priorities change. Minimalism. You know, keep the screen simple. Card diagrams wouldn't work, right? And then finally, usability. So these, I think, should be the best practices. And then uh, there is a simple example, right? How we, you know, uh, perceive things. You know, we just look at th uh, things as a whole, and then you know, divide them into bits. You know, there are ten, uh, there are so many chairs. Changes to there are 50 chairs. Okay, there are red chairs, yellow chairs. So perception, how it is processed is, we look at it at a, as a whole, and then you know, uh, bit by bit we digest the information, and finally there is an objective. I need to go sit somewhere. We go and sit in an empty chair, right? That is how the perception happens. That is the same way in which we have to approach the big data UX. Right? We have to dream big, as I said. Walmart dream, dreamt big. They dissected it into small elements. I want to concentrate on these markets. And then they defined a pattern saying, OK, for this market, I'm going to concentrate on 1, 2, and 3. Here, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So those kind of patterns are formed. And finally, designed for decisions. And then they win. But then the problem is, we should never be convinced with our solution. We should keep on improvising. Right? That is something which, which is key here. That brings us to the second part of the story, which is the successful story after we follow the big data UX cycle. Right? There is Jane Doe, obviously a woman, I mean a, a woman wins, a man loses in our story, right? So Jane Doe comes in, puts the same request, and this time there is a team which has visualization experts too. Now they come up with a dashboard, which is simpler. Though it's big data, they, it is simpler. There are so many users. This is the most time spent on a page. The most clicked button is buy and sell, which is clicked 20, 35 times. You want to look at it as a number, look at it. If you want to look at it as a graph, look at it. And these are the top five screens that the users use. Simpler, right? Can anybody say that this is confusing? I don't think so. It's easy, right? It's easy to understand because it gives you insights, not just big data, insights. Right? So what, what, what is the difference that we have between John Doe and Jane Doe? Right? So, yeah, uh, we can get to the questions part. One minute, please. I'll just complete this.
bear with me sorry sorry about that right so the difference here is jane do uses key data and john do uses big data right this is decision centric that lacks insights insights are what is going to propel your solution this is user centric that is technology centric that with that moral of the story in mind i say that you know with your intervention big data dashboards can reach a higher level of maturity we don't need to get to a place where it is dark can get to a better place right that's the idea so i guess i'm on time